It all seemed so simple when we learned about it as kids. Red means stop. Green means go. Look both ways when you cross the street. But managing traffic flow safely is a lot more complicated. We try and balance the competing needs of uh, pedestrians, transit, and the vehicles. Welcome to Taken with Transportation, the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency's official podcast. I'm your host, Melissa Kalross, and today we're taking a look at how traffic signals work and intersections are managed. To begin, we catch up with SFMTA senior traffic engineer Bryant Wu in the Chinatown neighborhood near Knob Hill. So we're standing here at the intersection of Powell and Washington, and you have told me this is a really complex intersection. To me, a person who doesn't know anything about this, it just looks like streets. What makes it so complex? It's got literally everything. We're half a block from Gordon J. Lau Elementary. We're two blocks away from Firehouse 2. We have two uh, intersecting cable car routes, as well as proximity to the Central Subway Station, the topography, and the fact that we have approximately 130-year-old antiques for the cable car. This signal is the most complex, in my opinion, in the city. As activity swirls around us, Wu offers up more detail. This is the intersection of two opposing one-way streets. So Washington flows uh, westbound, east of the intersection, and flows eastbound, west of the intersection. And obviously, you don't want head-on collisions to occur at the same time, and so those two opposing directions never see a green light at the same time. Next, we have traffic on Powell Street getting the green light. In this case, both directions can go at the same time because no turns are allowed because you have two opposing one-way streets. We have a uh, pedestrian signal uh, at the south leg of the intersection. Uh, You can see it counting down. Countdown signals are commonplace now, but folks have to remember that 15, 20 years ago, they were a rare sight. And uh, we have a group of tourists with their family and they're holding a map. When that cable car comes through, they are gonna be detected by sensors located in the trackway. And uh, when they're coming through, depending on the direction that they're going, they will receive a white vertical traffic light that will be separate from the red, yellow, green signals for exclusively the cable car to be able to move. If that sounds like a lot to manage, well, it is. And Wu tells us that some users of an intersection get priority. Common misconception that folks have, understandably so, is that all they see in general are the red, yellow, and green lights. But in reality, the biggest importance to us is serving the pedestrians. Especially, we're mindful of the fact of the proximity of the school, as well as this particular area has a high concentration of seniors living in the area. We uh, give uh, more time than the uh, national standard for these uh, older pedestrians to cross, or younger children who are being escorted by their uh, parents or caretakers. And we also include in the signal what we call accessible pedestrian signals. That's for the individuals who are visually impaired. We also include, as part of our projects, features like curb ramps for individuals who are in wheelchairs or some other type of assisted walking device, whether it be a a walker or a cane. These are all features that we include as part of our signal projects. So first order of business is serving the pedestrians. Are cars held here longer than other intersections or longer than normal? I'm standing here watching the traffic. It doesn't seem like they're waiting terribly long. So everything's a balance, and that's what makes the intersection complex and the job challenging. And so we try and balance the competing needs of uh, pedestrians, transit, and the vehicles. And so one of the ways that we can do that is by including transit-only lanes or special means of detecting transit vehicles so that we don't give the time to those vehicles unless they're actually there and actually need it. What are some examples of sort of more simple intersections and what is the experience like at some of those for people who live and and move around the city? The simplest uh, intersection would be uh, a four-legged intersection out, for example, in the outer Richmond or in the outer Sunset districts. It goes red, yellow, green in one direction, it goes red, yellow, green in the other direction. 
and coupled with that we have pedestrian signals to go with it. Even that one uh, we have uh, little tricks here and there that we do to make things as safe as possible. So we do things like uh, what's called a leading pedestrian interval. This is where the pedestrian sees a walk light for about three, four seconds before the green light turns on. That gives the pedestrian the opportunity to establish themselves in the intersection and give them the right of way and uh, help reduce pedestrian related collision. Other things that we do is we coordinate the signals uh, to help control traffic speeds. Uh, we reduce speeding and uh, traffic moves more uniformly, which also reduces collisions. So even in a basic intersection out in the outer Richmond or the outer sunset, there's a lot of thinking that goes behind it. When we say complex, do we necessarily mean dangerous? No. First order of business is to make sure that everybody can move through the intersection safely. And when the situation calls for it, we separate the movement of pedestrians from the movement of transit, from the movement of bikes, from the movement of cars. So just a block down, for example, over on Stockton Street, uh, we have what we call pedestrian scramble, where all the pedestrians crossing go at the same time. And then after that happens, then the vehicles get to go. So first order of business, of course, is safety for all users and we may have to separate the movements if we have to, but we always make sure everybody can travel through safely. Traffic engineering starts with collecting good data, Wu says, including the number of vehicles and pedestrians that pass through an area and where they're going, emergency vehicle considerations, and for cable cars in particular, any operating limitations. Then the SFMTA collaborates with other city agencies such as Public Works, the Public Utilities Commission, and the Mayor's Office of Disability, as well as stakeholders like Walk SF. All of those play a part in designing a signal. So we have issues with accessibility, we have issues with drainage, hence the Public Utilities Commission is involved. They're also responsible for street lights, so we have the street lights. And then Public Works does uh, some of the electrical engineering design as well as the civil engineering design for things like the curb ramps, the grading of the intersection. And oftentimes they also manage the construction contract. So it's all of this collaborative effort that goes into designing and then operating the signal. And that's often why, much to the chagrin of your everyday citizen, uh, it takes so long to design and construct what would normally look like, you know, Christmas tree lights, but it's a lot more complex than that. Even with safety-focused designs, things do happen sometimes, and traffic signals and poles need to be replaced. That takes us across town to the SFMTA Traffic Signal Shop, where electricians and support staff maintain hundreds of traffic signals, communication systems, and related hardware. Traffic signal supervisor Ferdinand Lumbed gives us the lay of the land. A typical day for a traffic signal shop is basically we, our shift starts at 7 o'clock, where all the crew meets together and have their assignments assigned to them. Some of those assignments can be programming, a timing change to intersections, installing an APS button, audible pedestrian signals, or installing signals from different locations. As we walk around the shop, we happen upon a crew member programming an audio pedestrian signal. Washington, walk sign is on to cross Washington. We to cross Washington at Stockton. The crew also handles maintenance requests or complaints from all over the city. Traffic signal supervisor, John Affelter. Typically we uh, respond to very serious complaints right away, such as uh, cabinet knockdowns, electrical cabinets, that is, that control the intersections, traffic signal poles, live electrical wires, stuck intersections, turn vehicle heads, including pedestrian signals for obvious reasons. These are all really hazardous situations. Additional complaints that we respond to uh, that may or may not be as serious, uh, we have dark intersections and short circuits, mast arm signal damage, visor damage, out of synchronization, that's, you know, keeping the greens coordinated so traffic flows freely and not just for cars but for uh, trains, streetcars, buses, for bicycles as well. Affelter describes a few recent incidents in which signal equipment was hit by cars. This one here is a uh, Golden Gate and Golf. Street light pole with traffic signals on it 
lots of signage. Nailed it right in the center of the grill, knocked the pole down. Fortunately, nobody was hurt. And this one here is Alemany and Farragut. And you can see it looks like scorched earth where they hit the electrical cabinet, knocked it over, and somehow it ignited. And it also caught the uh, PG&E pole next to it on fire, which burnt the actual service that was providing the power for the intersection. So the intersection went completely dark. You can see uh, the cabinet was stretched out, all the wires got burned. And traffic signal electrician Dennis Verallen tells us about the repair work he did earlier this summer after an SUV ran into a traffic signal at 19th and Guerrero Streets in the Mission. This was actually Pride weekend, I believe it was. And it's just a block away from Dolores Park. The police were actually doing a really good job of kind of keeping people away from it. But myself and the line helper, we slung the pole, got it over this guy wire here, brought it down and, and took it apart so that the tow trucks could come in and actually remove the vehicle. Before that even, we've gone to the cabinet, made sure that the wires that are feeding the pole are, are all disconnected so there's no any potential for live circuits out there in the field. So this particular one, we had to put up a temporary base, which is basically a two and a half foot diameter concrete base with just a small pole on it, and we'll put a temporary signal there so that cars and pedestrians have signals until we can get a real pole up. Back at Powell and Washington Streets, Bryant Wu wraps up our discussion with a little more about transit signal priority. This particular intersection has cable car detection, but uh, many of our intersections throughout the city also have both bus and emergency vehicle detection. The city's Transit First policy directed us to prioritize the movement of transit, bikes, and pedestrians. So. These uh, type of detection systems are used, again, to promote uh, transit, uh, reduce travel time, reduce their delay, and we use that same system to reduce the delay of our first responders. You can't see it, it's all wireless, and you might see some antennas and equipment mounted uh, on the signal poles, but uh, there's a lot of thought and a lot of work that goes into it, and uh, you may not realize it until you actually need that type of service. Thank you for joining us on Taken with Transportation. We're a production of the San Francisco Municipal Transportation Agency, and you can find the latest episodes at sfmta.com slash podcast, as well as Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. I'm Melissa Call Ross. Be well and travel well. <laughs>